Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the subject of defining a roadmap for effective distribution energy resource management. My name is Chris Yellen and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence and I'll be your host today signed in from Johannesburg. Big welcome also to all our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm also going to share a link with you now in the Teams chat facility where you can download all the present biographies. Please take a look at the chat and you will see a link which you can click on to download the presented biographies. A big welcome also to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. This webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence. But I'd like to acknowledge and thank GE Venova, the Association of Municipal Electricity Utilities of Southern Africa, or the AMEU, the City of Cape Town Electricity Department, and City Power Johannesburg for their most valued support and participation in this webinar and for the great work that they do in this field. We have close on a thousand delegates uh, who have registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as the stature of the presenters. So may I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and the effort that they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend, as well as publicly. While the presentations are in progress, please do send your questions on the Teams Q&A text facility, not on the chat facility, please. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally, and we'll certainly try and get to those questions. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, as South Africa's energy landscape evolves, the integration and management of distributed energy resources becomes crucial for a, for a resilient and sustainable power system. So this webinar aims to discuss the key aspects of a roadmap for the effective management of distributed energy resources in South Africa, with a focus on the use of distributed energy resource management systems for effective and efficient management of these resources. Through expert insights, the webinar, the webinar will explore firstly the current state of the distributed energy resources in South Africa, and they will be analyzing the existing landscape of rooftop solar, mini grids, wind, and other distributed energy resource technologies, including the challenges and opportunities. Secondly, uh, this uh, webinar will look at the policy and regulatory framework, examining the existing policy environment and proposing improvements to support widespread distributed energy resource adoption and integration. Thirdly, uh, we'll look at the technology and infrastructure needs uh, while identifying technological solutions and infrastructure, infrastructure upgrades that are necessary for efficient distributed energy resource management. And finally, we'll look at international best practices uh, and try and draw on the lessons from successful distributed energy resource implementation in other countries. And while I'm on this point, I have scheduled a further webinar on the 27th of March, where we're going to look and try and take some lessons from Australia, a country which has done uh, great things in terms of maximizing its renewable energy potential and its grid uh, in, in increasing the penetration of renewable energy uh, within the grid and within networks. Well, the program for today has been widely circulated, but I'm going to now share to download the program uh, here on the Zoom chat facility. So again, please take a look at the Zoom chat facility and you'll have a link to download the program for today. There will be four 20-minute presentations, after which I'm going to share a link to a short poll and survey on the Teams chat facility. So once I do this, and I'll let you know when it's uh, been shared, please uh, complete and submit the survey poll 
which will give us valuable feedback on further follow-up actions and webinars going forward on the subject of distributed energy resource management. More of this later, and I'll let you know when the, uh, when the poll and the survey has been shared so that you can uh, participate in this and give us your feedback. It's quick and easy. Uh, you don't have to spend more than a minute uh, on the poll, uh, and it will be very useful for us going forward. So uh, now we're moving on to the presentations and Vali Pariachi, the strategic advisor of the Association of Municipal Electricity Utilities of Southern Africa, will now make an opening address and give a few insights of his own on the subject at hand. Vali is a seasoned professional in the power and energy sectors with a Master of Science and an MBA degrees and over 40 years of experience. He started his career in the petrochem industry at Shell, BP, Mobile, Engine and AEC and then moved to Eskom Generation, where he held a number of executive level positions. Thereafter, Valley spent a decade at City Power Johannesburg in various senior executive capacities. And after leaving City Power, he then moved into the private sector, where he held senior executive management positions at Gibb Engineering, Gibb Capital, PDNA Mott McDonald, uh, Thyssen Krupp, and Powertech. Valley is currently the strategic advisor to the AMEU, and the executive officer of Piazza. Piazza is the Power Institute of East and Southern Africa, and he's also the chairman of the NRS Association of South Africa. So without further ado, I will now call on Vali Pariachi to deliver his opening address. Over to you, Vali. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and a very good day to all colleagues, friends, and uh, fellow participants from wherever you are internationally and, and locally. It's, it's my pleasure to, to be the opening presenter. And, uh, and, and my role in this uh, webinar uh, today is a very simple one, but a very important one. Uh, I've been asked by Chris to introduce the subject matter. Uh, uh, um, in the context of the roadmap for distributed energy resources. So just to give it context, I will, uh, in the 20 minutes that I've got, I've got a few slides, and I'll just give you a macro picture uh, with, with a focus, obviously, uh, on South Africa. Let me get to my first slide. So let's... Um, uh, as an introduction, let's uh, understand uh, what do we mean by distributed energy resource management, because it could mean different things to different people, and, do, and depending on wherever you are in the world, it could also mean different things. Okay, so very simply, just to get it all on the same wavelength, uh, the distributed energy resource management is very simply planning, integration, operation and optimization of uh, uh, DERs within a grid system. And, and the resources that we'll focus on is renewable energy, energy storage systems, uh, demand response technologies, and other distributed generation assets. And I'll talk about that just now. And very quickly, the key aspects of, the, of that management system is, is these uh, um, attributes, but I think the important one that's kind of new in the arena is market participation, and, and South Africa is going into that arena shortly through the uh, through the creation of the transmission company, and of course the data analytics and so on. So these are the key aspects to it. But this uh, this point I make at the bottom is very very important because and. Let me read it out. Uh, developing a roadmap for DER management in South Africa has to be focused, contextual, and involve a comprehensive approach that considers the country's current and future challenges, energy landscape, the framework, sustainable goals. Now, in South Africa, uh, uh, we cover all of these. We are we have some significant challenges. So when we when we crafting out a 
distributed energy resource management strategy, those need to, to be taken into consideration. And I would argue, uh, if you're coming up with a, a resource energy management strategy, in South Africa, there's two phases. There's an immediate phase, which addresses all the challenges, and then we have a long-term phase. Right, so uh, given what I've just said, what, what is our understanding of the burning platform or the case for change, okay? And I'll, and I'll read this out again because it's also quite important, especially for the people that are outside our borders. Um, South Africa is currently in a national energy crisis challenge, which is characterized by the electricity um, crisis and it's evidenced by the inter alia, the severe or robust high stages of load shedding, and of course, its consequent negative impact. So we do have a national energy crisis that's characterized by a electricity crisis, and we have significant load shedding. Now, why this is important is that even though we may solve load shedding, we would still be in a energy crisis, and that's obviously the purview of the Department of Mineral Research and Energy, Mineral Resources and Energy. Now, just uh, continuing from that, the burning platform uh, affects the two major utility families. So the two major utilities, electricity utilities, are ESCO and the municipal utilities. So yeah, what we're saying is that in terms of the burning platform, which has to be factored in in a resource uh, management strategy, is that the current performance of these utilities, that's common Munich, and it's common knowledge, is arguably fast accelerating downwards in a negative spiral. And if we don't arrest it or turn it around, then it's going to be diabolical. And we would argue that these utilities, and I think we are there already, will not ex execute on their respective service delivery mandates. So those are the two main aspects of the burning platform. Then as engineers, before we start going to solution mode, we obviously come up with a problem statement. And from what I just said, the, the problem statement at a very high level is how might these power utilities, ESCOM and Munix, respond to their respective poor performances, current challenges, and emerging disruptors as a matter of urgency. And of course, there's, there's different facets to it. And one of them is the distribution side of the business. And how do we you know, sort of strategize from a resource management? And, and of course, we'll talk about that in the next hour and a half or so. Right, so uh, a picture say many a story. And uh, so I distilled this down sort of schematically. And I've introduced two major terms here. It's the it's the constipation and the entropy. So what what we're saying here is that the current grid, and I would argue it's transmission and distribution, is currently constipated. And that brings up all the attributes of being constipated. In other words, as you see pictorially here, as engineers, we have a grid that where we can put as much energy upstream as possible, but we don't get it on the downstream side. So from an engineering perspective, and this is a term, a new term that I've introduced in this context, is that on the constipated side of the grid, whether it's transmission or distribution, the entropy is I. So on this part of the grid, on my left-hand side, the entropy is I. And entropy is defined uh, not from the second law of thermodynamics, but it's an offshoot off shoot of that. It's a lack of order or predictability. In other words, it's a gradual decline into disorder. So at the moment, I would argue our grid, transmission and distribution, given all its challenges, is in a state of disorder from an entropic point of view, 
and constipated. And we need to migrate from a grid that is constipated and high entropy to one that is deconstipated and low entropy. And that's the essence of the distributed energy resources management strategy uh, that we're going to talk about just now. Right, so how would, how would a typical uh, roadmap uh, for an effective distributed energy uh, resource management uh, look for South Africa? And I've got two slides on this. So uh, we obviously got to look at the policy and regulatory framework. Now, South Africa has been significantly regulated. Uh, I'm talking about the energy sector, and uh, there's been a lot of legal uh, sort of statutes in the book. But in the last couple of years, we've made significant uh, strides in this area, but work still needs to be done uh, to further what I call deep bottleneck uh, the legislative framework area. Then. Item two, stakeholder engagement. Now, this is quite significant. If I had to draw the line between government stakeholders, private sector, uh, residential, et cetera, uh, there has to be significant engagement. Plus, we also in South Africa have the National Electricity Crisis Committee, which is another important stakeholder. So in the last few years, there's been significant interaction between the stakeholders. And I would argue we've been successful in most of those interactions, because if you don't, uh, then any movement on the uh, development of strategies will not work. Then item three is the, uh, it's typical, all utilities globally going forward. We are now moving into uh, the, uh, the era of uh, digitization. Right, so it's all data analytics. In fact, arguably now we've got so much of data and information, etc. How do we confer? How do we uh, accelerate uh, reasonably data into information and information into uh, into intelligence? And uh, and of recent, obviously. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine language uh, as far is fast gaining traction in the space, and we're now beginning to introduce, or we need to introduce AI, machine language, into the space technology mix to fast track decision making and accelerate data and number crunching. Now that's critical because in the crisis situation. If we can save as much time as possible in getting into intelligence information, we can make quicker decisions. So AI, machine language, data analytics is quite important. Item four is also quite uh, critical from a South African perspective. And if we just get to the uh, uh, to the red bullet point, what what we're saying here is that the uh, as I said. Uh, the grid is constipated, uh, high entropy, uh, et cetera. And to, to deconstipate it, et cetera, you would normally build new infrastructure. So you build new transmission grid, you would build new distribution grid, uh, you would strengthen the distribution grid, et cetera. But in South Africa at the moment, the fiscus, meaning national treasury, government, uh, ESCOM and the municipalities are significantly cash constrained, right? So access to capital is uh, not easy. And of course, South Africa, given our challenges, um, in many fronts, we are not favorably, uh, we don't have favorable investment climate. So what we need to do, and, and we're discussing this, the NEACOM structures, is to look at technologies, technologies, other technologies that can be introduced so that we can use the existing infrastructure to squeeze out every additional electron, new electron on the existing grid. And the immediate technology is obviously ancillary services, 
and that includes energy storage, all the energy storages like um, pump storage, battery storage, and I guess Paul Camilo and Justin will talk a lot more on the battery storage side of things. So ancillary services is gaining significant traction. We need to bring more and more of that so that we can use the existing grid. Right, point five, capacity building and training. We also have another significant challenge in the South African grid, I mean, in the South African space. We've lost a lot of skills and competencies. Lots of people have retired. We haven't filled that, that gap. Lots of people have gone overseas. Uh, we have lots of youngsters, energetic, but we need to upgrade to skills to competency levels. And we are falling behind in that, and we need to do a lot of work uh, in that area in terms of capacity building and training, if any resource strategy has to work. Community empowerment. Uh, in South Africa, this is a big, a big thing. From the distribution side, I would argue that um, that cooperatives generally work a lot better, and any resource uh, strategy has to bring in uh, community involvement on it. Financial mechanism, we can have a whole webinar or a number of uh, webinars on, on the financial uh, funding challenges. Now, as I mentioned, ESCO and Munich are financially distressed. What we need to look at, if possible, <coughs> is um, uh, bringing the private sector in as best as we can. We've got to look at uh, off-balance sheet uh, uh, funding, funding models, uh, boot, bot, uh, uh, share of revenues, uh, et cetera, et cetera, looking at uh, operational leases, capital leases. So uh, look at grants. Obviously, grants will be the, uh, the first point of call. And then uh, uh, otherwise, uh, because remember this, this sector, this industry is very capital intensive and asset intensive. So, and that's why it's taking a bit uh, longer to, to roll out these new electrons uh, onto the grid. Arguably, the global uh, geopolitical conditions are also exacerbating uh, the conditions. Uh, we being in Africa, the deepest south, uh, we tend to fall back uh, in the queue, and uh, especially in terms of uh, storage. Uh, and uh, and if you want to jump the queue, you you pay at a huge uh, at a huge cost. But arguably, uh, the funding has to be sorted out because, uh, unfortunately, and I think this is an important point. We are trying to solve a crisis situation where there's inherent challenges within the municipalities and ESCOM. So you've actually got two crises in here. You've got the power crisis, the electricity crisis, and then you have survival crisis, if I call it, between the utilities. And generally, from a good business management point of view, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be addressing one crisis, solving that and getting to the others. But we don't have that luxury. So, so if you, and I don't want to get there, but if you look at the VGBEB report, they also argue on the same lines that we need to separate uh, the crises. And then, of course, uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation, uh, any strategy. Uh, uh, that, that's being implemented, uh, any business models, et cetera, you need to uh, what you call assess if it's working. In this case, you could evaluate the frameworks, assess the performance, impact, and, and sustainability, and, and review and update. And uh, and I'm now going to move on to our next presenter. Uh, my humble apologies, Valley, uh, uh, that uh, we lost you there. 
but I'm moving on now to our next speaker, which is Frederick Wauke. I hope I have not butchered your surname. Fred, perhaps you can remind us uh, how to pronounce it. <laughs> uh, but uh, please, uh, can I introduce to you, Fred? Uh, he is the Distributed Energy Resource Management System Product Management Leader at GE Venova Grid Software. Uh, he's dialing in from Paris, and he's in charge of strategy, roadmap definition, and execution for the solution design to help utilities around the globe turn the renewables and distributed energy resource disruption from a threat to an opportunity. Fred has over 20 years of experience in international business to business development uh, and a power solution and service line that he co founded for telecoms networks in areas with poor electricity supply received the European Commission's Sustainable Energy Europe Prize in 2010. So it's an absolute honor and privilege to have an international speaker of the stature of Fred from uh, GE Vanova. And I'd now like to call on you, Fred, to make your presentation. Thanks a lot, Chris, for the introduction, and thanks a lot, really, for uh, the opportunity to exchange today. I'm very honored to be contributing to this uh, webinar uh, along with, with Valley, Gordon, and Paul. And thanks, uh, Valley, for the very nice uh, presentation you gave already on the overall framework of the discussion here in South Africa. So I hope you see my screen. Can you confirm, Chris? Yeah? It's yes. Nice. Okay, very good. So what I'll be bringing to the to the table uh, today uh, to complement the other speakers is uh, the point of view of a vendor, the point of view of a global vendor. And uh, so I'll dive more into some of the operational challenges of how to integrate uh, DRs and, uh, and how to solve for those challenges and giving a global perspective on lessons learned from other geographies and how they are relevant for the South Africa context. So we spend, you know, coming back to the challenges that the DRs are causing uh, to grid operations. Then, you know, why DERMs? Uh, really, how can we turn the DRs from a threat to an opportunity indeed? Then what are the key DERMs functions that you need? And on this one, it's really important to realize that all, not all DERMs are uh, alike. Not all DERMs are targeting the same types of functions. So it's very important to understand really what you need. And, and we'll go through kind of a typical DR management journey and the lessons learned from other uh, front runners utilities, right? So I'll start with the DR uh, challenges. Uh, so the, the recipe to carbon reduction in every geography, uh, you know, pretty much has always the same two ingredients, which are electrification, notably transportation and heat, as well as the use of renewable energy is a large transmission uh, connected wind or solar farms, or medium or small, connected rather to distribution grid. Obviously, in the context of South Africa, as, as Valley reminded, uh, you know, distributed generation is very much, uh, you know, a, a critical tool for uh, the lack of capacity, right, and to increase the generation capacity. But so as you go and electrify more and add more renewables onto the grid, the three big challenges you're facing are, are here, which is that the first one, you're using uh, the grid much closer to its limit, right? So you've got the network capacity challenge. And as Vali said, right, you don't want to overinvest into very expensive uh, grid capex infrastructure, but still you need to operate the grid much closer to its limit. The second challenge is that you've got brand new electrical patterns that are brought by those DERs, and we'll come back to what those uh, look like, which makes that the traditional paradigms about how the flow is is you know moving on the distribution grid are really completely upside down, and the third one is new stakeholders and new regulations, right? New stakeholders with aggregators, with DR service providers, with microgrid operators. I mean, you name those, they all need to make their living to make a healthy business. In addition to the UTT uh, meeting their missions, and new regulations are there to try and help orchestrate the overall ecosystem, right? So the key question here is really how to allow more DRs to connect to the grid while keeping the lights on for everybody and at the minimum cost for the overall community. And so for grid operators, are DRs only creating problems or can they be a solution as well, right? So that's what we're going to see. So I was talking about new electrical patterns. Uh, I'll point to several of them just so that everybody understands the magnitude of the challenges, frankly, that those DRs are creating to the grid. 
So the first one is voltage quality, obviously one of the first KPIs that you need to drive as a distribution grid operator. And so when you have a, what we call a solar neighborhood, typically, which is a neighborhood with a lot of residential homes or commercial or industrial buildings are equipped with rooftop uh, photovoltaic uh, PV kits, then if typically you've got a midday and a mild day where you've got not a lot of heating or not a lot of air conditioning, not a lot of load anyway, you've got low load and a high generation. And when this is the case, if you see the voltage is increasing and increasing to the point that you may really face voltage violations. And if it happens that just a cloud cover passes by, suddenly the generation drops a lot and you suddenly now are back to a low voltage situation. And so you're you face the risk to be always, you know, over voltage, under voltage with an intermittency that obviously comes from, uh, you know, cloud cover typically, right? So voltage quality is, is a challenge in presence of DR. Hidden load is yet another challenge. So this one is hitting to the second KPI, which is really the reliability of the grid, right? So in presence of distributed generation, you do not have any more just one load. You've got two loads on the grid. So the first load is your native load, the native consumption, but a part of it is actually covered directly by the embedded distributed generation. So typically the PV on the rooftops of all the residential homes uh, that are on the feeders. And therefore the load that you see running on the feeders is the net load, which is native load minus the hidden load. And so that's all fine, except you know, at the point when you've got a fault happening on a feeder, what happens is that the smart inverters of the PV kits, they trip for loss of primary voltage. And therefore, you know, right before the fault, you had the net load rather low. And suddenly when you need to reconnect and reconfigure the grid to solve for the fault, this is a much higher load that you need to pick up actually, right? And so what is at stake and what you see to the little graph to the right hand side is, you know, being aware at any point in time on every feeder of how much is the hidden load is paramount so that you can anticipate uh, you know, the restoration routines that you've got uh, to, to put in place every time you've got a fault happening, right? That's the hidden load challenge. The third challenge is around back feeds, right? If you go back to the solar neighborhood use case I was mentioning, low load, high generation, uh, what happens is that you now have an inversion on flow and you've got uh, flow going up the voltage levels. And not only do you have an inversion of flow, but also in absolute value, those flows can be higher then the normal flow going down that the transformers, that the breakers were all designed to support when the grid was designed like decades ago, right? So flow going up in absolute value can be much higher than, than the ratings of the equipment. So which creates some, uh, you know, reliability issues and CapEx issues on, on the grid overall, right? Those challenges are co actually cutting across uh, transmission and distribution, right? It's not just, uh, challenges that are limited to distribution. So I'll give two examples here. The first one to the left-hand side is a great use case that comes from Australia, where that particular day there was a huge cloud cover uh, came in from the sea and that shady that once a geographic area, very large, that used to be uh, home for a lot of residential homes and businesses and commercial malls that were equipped with a lot of rooftop PVs. And because this big cloud shaded all those uh, PV kits at once, even though they were all very uh, granular, very small at the low voltage level, it created a loss of generation that was equivalent to when the system is losing one very large conventional generator. And so therefore that directly hit the frequency of the overall system, right? So very small DRs impacting up to the system level. The right hand side is the other way around, if you will, is a day and that's uh, coming from the Netherlands where there was a lot of wind and solar generation at the bulk level, at the transmission level, but so much that the TSO could not do its balancing job anymore. And so therefore they had to ask the DSO for help. And so they had to ask the DSO to curtail some of the embedded generation, which was happening at the distribution level so that the balancing of the overall grid be secure, right? So that's kind of the other round, big renewables suddenly at transmission level impacting down at distribution. Distribution needs to curtail to help the overall system, right? So that's talkative of, of the T and D nature of those challenges linked to renewables and, and DERs, right? So, so therefore, why would you need DERMs? Well, the answer is really that you want to solve all the challenges we've been 
showing right now. And you want to return those DRs from a threat to an opportunity because they can bring a lot of things actually to the system. So if we see those four pillars here, to the left-hand side, uh, you know, in some geographies, we know that because of, of electrification, you will have, uh, you know, a multiplier really to the overall electricity demand, like times two or times three, even in some geographies. So obviously, if you put and locate those EV chargers, typically everywhere on the grid, and in an unmanaged fashion, you will multiply a lot of uh, load congestions on many feeders and transformers and substations. But if you manage to synchronize the charging events at the times when you actually have an excess PV generation, that's a win-win, right? The additional PV generation is helping to feed in, into the chargers of those cars. But at the same time, the charging at the right time prevents the backfeed situation, prevents the high voltage variation because it consumes the embedded generation right at the right time and at the right place. And so you avoid all the challenges we've seen in the in the first section, right? The second column here, upside down generation. So in some countries, DRs have been used so much uh, to increase the overall capacity of the grid that you now have more generation coming in directly from distribution than there is flowing from transmission into distribution. And so that obviously translates into distributed generation impacting a lot the system level, if we've seen uh, in the Australia case. Uh, but also these DRs, as we've seen in the Netherlands case, can actually help the balancing, right? If they are harnessed, if they are managed, if they are synchronized, they can really help the system level. And vice versa, if for transmission use cases, you want to use some VPP, say use a demand response event, uh, you know, to help for the balancing, those demand response devices, they're actually located at the distribution level. And so if you do that in an unmanaged fashion, what you may cause is further issues at the distribution grid, right? You solve for transmission, but you create more issues at distribution because you may tap into devices in a pocket of the grid where there is already a low load and a high generation. So if you reduce the load even further with demand response, you exacerbating the backfeed and high violations issues, right? So you need again, you know, to synchronize transmission and distribution. So you need to harness and to really synchronize those DRs. The third column here calls to the severe weather events. Unfortunately, climate change is happening. And so we see more and more severe weather, uh, weather events happening. And DRs, obviously, in addition to the you know, increased capacity that they're bringing, they are decentralized. So they help to keep energy adjacent in some pockets of the grid. There is restoration. And we've got even projects where we are using DRs for the ultimate black start scenario, right? Cybersecurity is the fourth one. Uh, obviously, if you want to you know, harness all those DRs and be able to monitor and control them, uh, you need to do that in an efficient and cost-effective manner, which is over the internet, and we'll come back to that. And so, yes, that increases uh, you know, the attack surface to your whole enterprise, uh, but if this is secured, uh, this is something that you solve and that, you really, uh, that really allows you, and, you know, to unlock this flexibility to help for the overall grid. So the net of all this is to say that grid operators cannot keep the DRs unmanaged, right? You cannot just welcome DRs onto the grid and hope for the best to happen if you don't manage DRs. So that's really why DERMS is critical to, you know, bring this additional capacity in a way that, that uh, to take Valley's words, you, uh, you know, you, you don't create more entropy, right? You create more order, predictability as you synchronize all those resources all together. So, uh, so there are various definitions of DERMS. So here is, is one by Gartner, uh, a comprehensive solution to, you know, communicate, control, orchestrate, optimize uh, either customer-owned DRs or, or third-party-owned DRs uh, in, in the grid context. So that's the wider definition of DERMS. Uh, what I think is more interesting is to see, you know, really who uses DERMS and therefore that's totally of the challenges it's solving. So three user persona here, the grid operator, the grid engineer, and the program admin. The grid operator is really the one who ensures the safe operation of the grid. The pain points is that he sees more and more of, uh, you know, backfeed situation, high or low voltages, intermittency stuff. So he, he suspects that the DRs are causing those issues. But because the DRs are not managed, if they don't have a DERMS, uh, you know, they can't really uh, trace back to the cause, right, and understand and, and, and root cause analyze those events. 
uh, as they become more frequent. And the ADMS alone cannot provide adequate information. And so more and more with only an ADMS, you uh, trending towards uh, misrepresentation of the reality, right? And so, so that's what the grid operators are, are, are suffering from in their daily job to keep the KPIs right and to keep the grid secure with the right quality of service. The grid engineer is really there to help the grid operator. So designing some uh, you know, business processes and business routines and switching logics and all that. Uh, the grid engineer sees that more and more the traditional uh, logics are failing. You know, think of the hidden load uh, paradigm that we were talking earlier. And so they want to help the grid operator. They want to tune and design new processes, but they don't have the tools to really what cause what, what happens and to evolve those processes. So that's a big, big pain for them as well. Program administrator is this role where, you know, in some utilities where there is already some demand response program. And so they've got siloed programs. They want to evolve those. They want to enroll more devices, but don't they don't really have scalable tools to do that. And and so they are uh, left with just a few handles that they can pull together, but it's not something that can really evolve. So that's the pain points that those those uh, user persona are facing. And, and, you know, and DERMS is really there to solve all those pain points and to bring predictability and order and, and better use of the DRs which are at hand. So, uh, so what are the key DERMS functions now? I was saying in introduction that not all DRs are DERMS are alike, right? And so, so we need to spend you know a few minutes on on what are the key the key DERMS functions here. So the first one is you need ubiquity in communications. There's a zillion different pathways to DRs, even using a my head end communication or using internet based communications. So you need to use the standards as much as possible. IEEE 2035 is really the leading standard. Open ADR as well. But you need also to have an ecosystem of vendors because some DR vendors they are not using. Uh, the standard communications, uh, Tesla, for instance, Nest as well. So you need that ecosystem uh, play as well. And you need a flex market interface in the case that uh, regulation mandates to go through flexibility market. So ubiquity in communications is key. The second one is having grid centric DR programs. To the left hand side, you've got traditional program uh, that you may have with demand response. With you, you've got one smart thermostat program, one EV program. Uh, and then maybe the grid operator has a particular peak shaving program using a grid scale batteries. All those are completely siloed. So what you need is to gather all those programs into grid centric programs that say, you know, I want to peak shave in the evening using all the resources that are, which are there. I want to consume the excess power of PV generation in the afternoon, but using all the combination of the yards which are at hand. You don't want to be device centric. You want to be grid centric. That's a key, a key one. Uh, the third one is forecasting uh, intermittency it is key in all those challenges. And so you need to have very strong forecasting with the whole library of different algorithms. You want to be able to adapt to missing data or poor quality data because you don't always have the right data at the low voltage level. You want that to be grid topology aware across t &D, and you want really to be able to ingest external forecast and play on the forecasting governance between the TSO, the DSO, the aggregators, all that. The third one is uh, the optimization, and that, that's paramount. Once you've modeled the DRs, you monitor them, control them, all that, you need ultimately to have the tool to optimize the DRs to solve for the grid. And so you've got levels of optimization. The first one is the site level, like optimized just for a residential or commercial site. That's what the DR service providers are providing. VPP optimization is the second level. That's what an aggregator would provide. So it's delivering flexibility events out of a particular portfolio, but that's not grid aware at all, right? To become grid aware, you need grid DR optimization, meaning an optimization that is really power flow based, that has the full model of the grid, and that is amount to define the amount of flexibility needed. A VPP cannot do that define the amount of flexibility needed for the grid or allowed to respect the grid physics. And it should be techno-economic, right? And so if you've got all those, uh, you can have such use cases like this dynamic interconnection that you know is some that is implemented and running in many geographies, including Australia, where essentially you say you've got the whole solo growth, you've got high interconnection costs, long wait times, and inequitable access to the network. So what you want is to have an active program where this grid DR optimization from DERMS 
is sending out some operating envelopes to the DRs so that they respect these maximum import and export limits. And you're sending that in advance. And so every smart inverter is tracking against those limits so that you know the, the, the end customer is making the best use of the PV kits, but in a way that respects uh, the limits of the distribution grid. And you can also share those dynamic operating envelopes with the wholesale market, with the flexibility market, with the TSO, all that. So that's a very powerful uh, concept that is across countries. Infrastructure deployments is also very important. On-prem or private cloud uh, or, uh, or vendor cloud is very important as you will evolve and seek more capacity. And so that's the key attributes of, of, of uh, you know, a key terms uh, for you as a grid operator. I'll end up soon, uh, Chris, so with just this DR management uh, journey, just to say there's a natural pathway uh, in terms of, uh, you know, from maybe the situation you're in today that you have very little DR awareness to initial level of DR awareness and modeling to being able to monitor and control those in a technical fashion to ultimately being able to control and optimize them for not just technical, but also the economics of it. And so that's the pathway that typically all utilities are going from. Uh, although they, they start with you know, uh, different exact modules or, or use cases, depending on their particular situation. So uh, I'll conclude now just to say that uh, in terms of the roadmap for effective DR management, the lessons learned from, from, from our utilities are, are, are that it's been done essentially, right? So. So you should start now, and you should start now for scale, because the maturity of the solutions that exist on the market today are that, you know, for the better ones, for the best ones, is that they are ready for scale. So you may start with a pilot, but start using actual product, not, not bespoke stuff that you would be the, the sole uh, utility to, to use around the globe. So what are your priority use cases? It's very, it's very important to lay out clearly. Use best practices from other geographies. One example very quickly is that Australia, in just a five years time frame, adopted IEEE 2035 in their regulation. It was born in the US, Australia said, that's great, let's use it. And now it's in regulation and, and that's now being rolled out in, in many DSOs in Australia. You may come back to this, Chris, in your next webinar. Use those standards, absolutely, and use a modular architecture, right? You don't want to, to start with a big bang, you want to go step by step. So you want to implement modules stepwise as you need them and start with the no regrets, right? There will always be very political, frankly, discussions about TSO and TSO coordination, about you know pricing and, and incentives to the end customer, all that. Yes, but you need to harvest the DRs which are being rolled out, model them, monitor them, forecast them, control them. All these are no brainers, so please start with this. Cloud readiness, zero trust, and data management are paramount. And you really want to pick a partner for the solution, but also for the expertise. So I'll stop there. Uh, you'll have in the, the slide here just uh, some sample resources. We're working a lot with uh, industry analysts, which are uh, you know, coming up with very interesting analysis. And so Gartner and Guidehouse are two of them that can bring you some, some good uh, uh, additional resources on this journey. Okay, so that's what I had to share. Thanks a lot, everybody. Back to you, Chris. Well, thank you very, very much, Fred, for a really fantastic presentation. Uh, I found it, uh, I could understand it, and that's important that uh, people can understand, but at the end, uh, I think you came up with some very practical advice on uh, this roadmap, this path ahead that we need to follow. And uh, really, I, you know, sometimes in South Africa, we tend to believe we are completely unique. Uh, but the point that you've made is there's a lot of learning experience out there. Uh, we do not have to start from scratch. We do not have to learn things the hard way. We can learn uh, from the experiences of others. Uh, and if we do it the right way, um, we can make great progress. And yes, you've referred also to this webinar, our next webinar on the 27th. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic and interesting uh uh, webinar on the lessons that were, you know that can be learned from Australia, uh, and Professor Anton Eberhard uh, led a delegation of municipalities from Eskom uh, and and from some key uh, industry people to Australia. He took his delegation there to learn uh, what can be learned from their experience. I think you've 
really uh, cemented that and uh, I think uh, set the the ground for the for the next webinar. So this subject is evolving. It is a hot topic. Uh, it is particularly relevant in the South African context. And it's really now my uh, great pleasure to introduce to you our next presenter, uh, which is Paul Vermeulen. Uh, he is the Chief Engineer, Renewable Energy and IPPs at the, in City Power Johannesburg. Uh, he joined uh, Johannesburg Electricity, as it was at the time, uh, in 1980 as a telecoms technician. He progressed to substation, telecontrol and SCADA systems, load management through centralized ripple control systems, demand side management, energy efficiency, alternative energy sources, energy storage, and these have all become absolutely key aspects in a modern electricity distribution system. So Paul was first qualified with an HND, Higher National Diploma in Electrical Engineering in 1984. And in 2014, he completed a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Energy Studies at the University of Johannesburg. And he's currently the Chief Engineer, Renewable Energy, IPPs and Feasibility Studies at City Power Johannesburg. Uh, it's, it's Johannesburg being, being, being the major city in South Africa. Paul is also a chairman of the uh, AMEU, uh, Gauteng branch, and he's a board member of the Southern African Energy Storage Association, SAESA. So great to have you here, Paul. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to you, uh, and we're looking forward to, have, to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks uh, for, the, for the invite to present. Um, and hello to everybody that's online. I presume the presentation is visible. Chris, you know, if you go and have a look at the, the Google definition of a DERMS is that it's the hardware and software that allows real time control of the batteries, inverters, the solar panels at the, at the so-called edge of the grid. Um, and they normally lie behind the meter and outside of the grid operators direct control. But for the purpose of this presentation, um, we acknowledge that City Power is definitely a grid operator. But we also lie behind the ESCOM meter and outside of the direct control of the national system operator, of course, except for load shedding, direct load shedding. And I think it's important to realize that we are the natural aggregator of all the, 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 the DERS on our networks. And our evolving role is to create working grid communities and coordinate whatever DERS are within our domain as well. So, when you asked me to do this presentation, I thought, let me do a stock take of what we've got embedded within our distribution network, and it's fairly substantial. <laughs> you know, you don't you don't quite realize what what's already going on. I mean, we've got our own gas turbines, which are being refurbished at the moment, so that's 80 megawatts total. We've got landfill gas generation sites that have been running since 2016. We've got gas generation, municipal owned, where we've put in a, a standby generator at the Joburg Theatre. Um, but because it's gas powered and not diesel powered, we can also use it for peaking. We've got uh, gas generation on our networks, privately owned, the likes of Absa Standard Bank and a couple of others, MTN. They are uh, privately owned gas generators that may have a surplus as well. That's why I call them semi-dispatched. We've got PV plus storage. We've recently put in our own one megawatt, two megawatt hour system here at Reuven in, in Joburg. But there's tons of this uh, uh, in the private hands. Um, and we estimate over 400 megawatts. And that comes from this recent Salga report um, that are at commercial and industrial, probably on our network is close to 400 already. And hybrid PV at residentials, I estimate 120, whereas the Salga guys we're saying for Joburg, it's maybe 95, but I think it is a bit more. Then we've also got private grid supported microgrids. A lot of inquiries are, are coming up uh, around this type of technology. So that's why I say it's in planning. And then intra-network IPPs and traders. There's also a lot of interest in trading across our network. And those embedded generators do also need to be controlled. So what Frederick was saying is that this is no longer trivial, small stuff. Okay. Um, if, if I consider that our, our kind of summer day load is maybe around about 16 to 1800 megawatts, what you see in front of you is something like 200 megawatts of semi-dispatched, maybe 80 megawatts of dispatched and, and self-dispatched close to 600 megawatts worth of, of, of distributed energy resources already on our network. So this is something we've got to start really paying attention to. And I think we have in the past, so we kind of know what we got to do, but how we get there is, is, is one of the issues here. 
So the overarching, from our perspective, the overarching energy resource management objective would be to have a look at our daily load profile, what we're presenting to ESCOM. And what you see there is our normal winter day with a morning peak and an evening peak. And the whole idea of managing these DERs is to come to a point where that ESCOM load profile is flattened as far as possible. And the reason for that is that the higher our load factor is, the lower the cost or the unit cost of ESCOM power becomes. And also, of course, we get penalized quite heavily for maximum demand charges as well. So we're kind of in a situation where it's lucky for us in a way because ESCOM is our base load energy supplier, but it's also our last resort supplier for peak period power. But obviously it's going to get more expensive as time goes by if we don't start to manage these peaks and troughs as best we can. So on the right hand side, you have I've modeled a bit of storage together with the PV that we've got on our network on the one particular power island, and then also a bit of gas generation and the combination of these things now becomes this flattened load profile. So in terms of managing DERs, there's there are two really, really two ways of doing this. The one is a passive control approach where you incentivize a load profile or behavior change using time discriminated tariffs, feeding tariffs and demand charges. And of course, the enablers here are the smart metering and billing systems, which we already do have. We've got programmable hybrid inverters, many of them on our network, but probably not being used correctly. We've got solar PV optimizer systems. Everybody walks around nowadays with a, a cell phone app that tells him exactly what's happening with his solar system at home. And you've got building and home energy management systems that are becoming more popular and associated with these things as well. Also very important here is customer education programs, um, getting across to customers why you want to do this. So the passive control approach applies to all customers really, CNI customers with discretionary scheduled load, where we can re reduce demand uh, according to the tariff signal, particularly high LSM residential customers, the ones with the stoves and the two geezers, et cetera, and customers with hybrid PV systems, which is also generally the high LSM residentials. Then also you've got the active control approach. Now an active control is real-time control where you require two-way communication control systems, and it requires integration of IT and OT systems from our perspective. I'll, I'll, I'll lean a bit on more on that just now. Enablers, the existing ones, SCADA monitoring and control, smart metering and billing systems, load management, hot water control systems we've got, home building management systems, et cetera. So now the smart metering and the SCADA do have substantial archiving capability. But what we're talking about now is, is so much data, it's terabytes of data that you need to manage and use that data to make sense of what you're going to be trying to do. So the active control approaches would apply to dispatch generation and energy storage facilities. All your demand response programs are, are active. Smart meter load, load limiting systems, our, our pilot has been tested in that regard. And smart meter dynamic time of use tariff systems, I think that the load limiting is going to evolve, evolve into a, a, a dynamic time of use to tariff in the future. We've got our hot water control systems in place already. And the new one is this internet-based home energy management systems. So there are those two, those two techniques that could be applied. From Eskim's point of view, from the generation and transmission um, perspective, you definitely want to be able to get hold of these distributed energy resources and send the signals through to us to do that. So for example, frequency control, um, Eskim would send a demand, uh, a demand response signal, and that needs to be relayed on to whatever we've got within our network. The same would apply to reserve margin management. That's also more of an active approach. But then you've also got this management of the morning and the evening peak, the evening peak in particular, where, where tariffs are used to do this, and we need to pass those messages on as well. But then we've also got our localized uh, resource management drivers we need to op optimize the security of supply. That's the most important thing, I think, for us. So we need to use dispatch uh, resources to minimize the, the load shedding quantum. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. If we can also uh, organize a, a little bit of load reduction in return for not load shedding, we, we try and grab a hold of that as well. But also we need to make sure that we reduce the demand beyond what Valley calls our constipated uh, substations, where you have uh, network constraints you would now want to start using these resources in a more 
targeted fashion, if I can put it that way. The one thing I also wanted to touch on here was that in terms of instantaneous peak demand control, you've also now got to start managing the energy deficits. And what I mean by that is PV systems that, for example, um, have used uh, their battery to ride through a, an energy uh, through a load shedding uh, incident. You know, when that when that system when the when the grid returns, um, that becomes a, a deficit, and and all of a sudden that system, if it's not correctly programmed, starts to suck up energy. It's a negative load kind of thing, uh, more or less what what Frederick was alluding to. Of course, we know about this from the hot water control systems. The longer you leave a geyser system off the more difficult it is to put the energy back that you need to put back. So it's no longer just trying to manage your peaks. It's also now trying to manage the deficits that you, you're causing within the energy system itself. And this kind of gives this picture of, of, of the whole thing. The DERs are generally in our domain, in fact, always in our domain. And you've got this scenario where you've got national control, regional control, our local distribution control, the end customer, and this this bilateral, uh, um, bi-directional communication and data flow scheme that needs to be set up and put in place, which we don't really have at the moment. We've got parts of it, but we don't have it. And those are, of course, the control signals moving in one direction and the response signals moving back in the other direction. So making it work in real time, information technology and operational technology needs to be integrated. So. A DER management system may be a standalone system or it might be a plug-on system. However, in our case, it's more likely to be a combination of an IT and OT with data integration links requiring an integration strategy. You're going to think, you have to think very carefully of that. We do have some initiatives in place, but they're not properly consolidated. The adoption of a standardized data model, such as the IEC 61970 series of, of a common information model, or the, or the IEEE standards, we, we need to make a choice here, um, but preferably one that also defines the standard application program in, interfaces between the systems. And then also it's been mentioned, uh, elements of smart grid technology do come into play to automate certain uh, network operations where you start putting DERs into your network. And it also usually requires modernization of parts of the distribution infrastructure Things like remote controllable RMUs to switch lights, to switch things in and out and to redirect load. Key to this, though, I think is the reliable telecom systems that you need. Optical fiber, self-healing wide area networks, all of those sort of things come into play. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do to get these to work. And also, the, 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 the probably the one that's getting becoming easy to access or the internet li links to the Wi-Fi network in each end customer's house. So I think we're going to end up um, uh, um, using that to, to, to quite a large, large extent. And then also we've heard a bit of this already, policy and regulation formulate, formulation. We need new policies of how to deal with these things. We can also perhaps have a look what has been done overseas and copy those, those directives as well. We also need to think of bylaws that need to come with this as well. Legal and commercial, you've got to establish the new business processes within the business here and get your 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 agreements and your legal standards, your standard use of system agreements, your standard commercial agreements tailored to the nature of the product that you that you want to engage. Also, application of relevant technical standards to engineer these DER facilities with the right functionality. So each type of technology requires some sort of a functional control capability. And you've got things like IEC 62898 that specify microgrids and how they should behave. Um, functionality, that this kind of functionality must be included from the very start of the engineering process. It's very difficult to go and put something back into a system if it's missing from the, from the start. And then of course, compli compliance to grid codes and national and international standards. The next few slides are, are just some experiences that we've had already um, and are, are, are more on the on the organizational change kind of thing. For example, the get landfill gas generation, the focus here needed to move towards keeping the evacuating network networks alive during load shedding. And that required a bit of a change of mindset within our own people maintaining the network where you have an outage that affects this you need to prioritize that and can't treat it like a normal outage. It doesn't work. 
This one is, a, is an interesting as one as well. We've got this dispatch municipal generation, and really what it's all about internally is managing the relationship. So wherever you see an arrow here, <laughs> there's some sort of information flow or some action and reaction that will happen. And if this lot's not coordinated, it becomes extremely difficult to get, for example, the Joburg Theater two megawatt um, uh, generator to work in a nice system beneficial way. The high LSM residential hybrid PV systems, I think there's a fantastic opportunity here at the moment. Well, that's the closest we have to the Google definition of a DERMS, I would say. And there's lots of them on our networks. If you look at the table on the right, you can see City of Joburg says we've got 84 megawatts. And this is from the Salga um, uh, re report that I'd mentioned earlier. So, so as in, apart from being the antidote to load shedding, these systems can also be used to huge system benefit if they're programmed right. And this is where resource aggregation through tariffs and smart meters is relevant. The time of use signals are needed to reduce the demand during peaks using the stored energy. And we need to apply actual demand charges to avoid energy hoarding and promote PV system optimization to recharge only from PV sources, for example. We've also got our Ruben one megawatt PV with two megawatt energy, energy storage. And the trick here is that you need a two mode control system. So when there's no load shedding, the, the, the plant needs to be used for arbitrage to reduce uh, cost of Eskin supply. When there's load shedding, however, this mode changes and it needs to be in a position where it can now provide the backup energy that you're expecting it to do. And that, look, that requires a bit of day ahead forecasting. What are, we, what are we gonna program this thing to do tomorrow, for example? It also leads on to, and we've had a lot of interest here where, where companies want to come and put in a microgrid which is really more an energy storage system that runs their whole property. Um, and the idea here is that we as the distributor could aggregate all of this. And instead of actually load shedding, we could reduce demand by simply aggregating and dispatching them all at the same time. But you need all of these things on the right hand side here to make this actually work. Um, quite a lot of things that you've got to set up um, within the business and without, outside of the business. And I think one point that by simply by enabling SSEG tariffs for bidirectional energy or trading, you actually simplify the control systems for your customers dramatically. So there's also a focus on getting those things to work properly as well. And then just the last slide here is a roadmap and summary. The management of the DERs extends way beyond the Google terms definition, as I'm sure you've realized. And for a distributor, the journey will require new organizational structures new functional units, including legal resources to create and administer the new contracts, the supply and use of system agreements. We need new technology, technical standards, research, maintenance and application. You need to be quite sticky on that. Engineering planning and construction management resources to provide access for these DERs. Engineering maintenance resources for your new tech. You need guys now that understand PV and gas generation and storage facilities. IT resources for the integration of OT and IT acquisition of new energy management systems or software additions. If you buy some new software, um, perhaps an archiving system, you've now got to integrate it and make that work with what exists already, or you must replace the entire thing. There's, there's merits to both. And then also IT resources to manage uh, secure data flows to outside of the organization. All of a sudden you're exposing your, your business to external uh, um, um, IT systems, resources to establish and maintain these external communication telecom systems, and internal management capacity to actually coordinate all these DERs internally, understand them, and send out the right dispatching signals, etc. And that's it, Chris, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Paul, for a really enlightening discussion about what City Power's resources are, what it's doing, and also some futuristic uh, about where we should be going uh, forward. It's really a fantastically interesting uh, uh, subject, and I, I've got absolutely no doubt uh, that we can overcome these grid constraints that we've got uh, by clever thinking. So uh, thanks again, Paul, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, to you our last presenter of the day, uh, and uh, that is uh, Gordon Dindy uh, from the uh, from Cape Town Electricity, 
and he's the manager of the distribution system operator uh, in the city of Cape Town. Um, and, uh, you know, this system has evolved from the traditional network control. Uh, and, and now we have the DSO model, uh, which provides additional functions that were traditionally performed by system operators, but they're now evolving or devolving, should I say, into distribution, uh, you know, as opposed to transmission because of the higher penetration of distributed re uh, energy resources and the associated power system complexity. So Gordon has over 20 years experience in power system operations and in managing control centers. And a highlight of his career was the successful consolidation of multiple fragmented municipal control centers into a really technologically advanced metro control center with a separate backup center providing dual redundancy. So really, uh, I think Cape Town is doing some fascinating work and Gordon is leading this work. Uh, and it's great to have you uh, here today, Gordon, uh, signed in from Cape Town. Over to you for your presentation, which we're really looking forward to. If you can please share your presentation at this point, uh, if that's possible. Right, thanks, Aha, Chris. There we um, go. Yeah, okay, I'm just, I'm gonna dive in. Sure. Okay, so as I was uh, preparing for this uh, presentation, I had an excellent opportunity to review the um, roadmap uh, for the evolution of the DER uh, and the initial planning, which was done um, many years ago, about five years ago, and compared it uh, to the reality. Um, and that is the way things have, have evolved. And it is clear uh, that changes and transformation uh, is happening at a faster pace than uh, what we envisioned, uh, largely accelerated by the higher load shedding stages. And uh, in order to define a roadmap for the effective uh, DER management, we need to understand the overarching uh, regulatory and uh, legislative uh, changes that are currently uh, currently taking taking place. Uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, touch on uh, the uh, um, the uh, regulatory and uh, legislative structures, uh, just focusing really on the on the Act, uh, the Electricity Regulation Amendment Act, uh, which has opened up um, uh, access of IPPs to the grid, uh, facilitating more investment, and also provides for a framework uh, for uh, distribution. Uh, of electricity between players uh, and uh, changes to licensing and registration, uh, regulation of prices, uh, 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 building in uh, introduction of uh, competitive, uh, competitive markets. And that has led to the development of um, uh, the uh, wholesale market code. Very interesting because that's actually gonna be released very soon for comment. And, uh, and then, of course, some amendments uh, that have taken place at the uh, NRS uh, specification level um, and uh, forming of the T uh, transmission system operator and market operator. And, um, and uh, that it's uh, likely to be interacting with the distribution system operators and, and utilities. And from a municipal point of view, um, we, we've done quite some significant amount of work in the energy strategy, which is uh, in the public domain and detailed in it is the utility reform. And uh, I've, on the left side here, you can see the institutional work from, uh, workforce uh, reforms that have taken place uh, so far uh, and uh, tariff uh, uh, financial reforms uh, that we are considering um, infrastructure and technology uh, reforms uh, that we are expanding uh, based on uh, exist existing technology. I will expand on all these items. And um, just in terms of the roadmap objectives, um, being to leverage the DER value across the supply chain. And this is 
quite interesting because the focus uh, from a customer point of view is in terms of their own interests, but we also have an interest in terms of the reliability and uh, network security, uh, which I will expand on a little bit further, uh, adopt new innovative business models. Uh, if you recall, I think most of the uh, network operators are predominantly uh, managing networks and we're moving into an environment where um, you know, we need to be looking at uh, system operating models that would then interface with the transmission system operator. Um, and, and that is uh, very critical in terms of the uh, DSO, uh, DER orchestration, uh, because the characteristic two-way energy flows could threaten the physical and operational limits of the distribution network, which is a major concern. We see it playing out already. Uh, it's playing out in the LV networks, um, and it's been uh, evolving over time, and we expect to see some of these things playing out uh, into the MV networks. Uh, point three, to implement new technological capabilities, um, uh, regulations and uh, market mechanisms uh, to support the integration, uh, improve network visibility, very, very important on the LVMV side of things, and, and leveraging uh, initially on existing systems as much as possible uh, as a least cost option to conduct a network hosting capacity analysis, uh, very critical, uh, to quantify the amount of unorchestrated uh, DER that can be installed at various points in the grid, uh, uh, and also with a view to defer uh, building additional network infrastructure, and then additionally to optimize through active network strategies that provide operational mechanism um, so that uh, DERs can actively be controlled to prevent breaching of physical and operational limits once again, and then also to pilot uh, innovative uh, structures, uh, tariff structures there. So benefits and services for the customer, uh, it has been primarily uh, uh, at the onset 2021-22, uh, customers started to uh, do their own connections. Um, and that was uh, driven by uh, load shedding mitigation um, concerns, avoided energy costs, uh, kind of secondary, uh, cash for power back uh, from the utility retailer. Some of the strategies that are being implemented by the city, which is providing incentives for the customer. And uh, I think uh, further down there, you've got a reduced carbon footprint. Um, and then on the network side, which is interesting, is the network reliability services that we will be looking at, um, and network capacity support, uh, deferred investment in network assets for the system, uh, ancillary services and flexibility, uh, reserve capacity, wholesale energy, and then for generators, retailer, retailers and new business opportunities, uh, risk management, overall portfolio management to hedge against higher energy prices and arbitrage. Um, opportunities for innovation and new product offerings. We should expect to see some of those things. And then in terms of uh, potential DER services uh, that can be uh, procured uh, either directly uh, by lateral agreements or through uh, market engagements, which we foresee in the future, that's uh, network reliability uh, when uh, the grid supply is lost. Uh, for instance, load shedding unplanned outages, uh, DER could have a major contribution. And then more specifically, uh, the uh, inverter responses uh, that would uh, be required uh, specifications, um, uh, that uh, need to be detailed with that in mind. And then a network capacity and support, uh, predominantly deferring or avoiding uh, investment in networks, as I've indicated earlier. Uh, active power uh, during evening peak uh, because of the variability in the load profile, which we have seen uh, has uh, transformed uh, significantly. We started to see differences uh, when we compared 
with previous years to last year's summer, beginning of summer into this year. Our reactive power to maintain voltage profile, uh, there we focusing on quality of supply and then delving into uh, ancillary services uh, where we see DER providing flexibility and ancillary services, uh, including contingency, frequency, question mark. Uh, we, we need a little bit to expand on that uh, because the responsibility is a system operator. So it's that coordination that needs to take place. Um, voltage regulation and location specific services. Uh, we've seen uh, NMD exceedances in parts of our network um, where a DER could and uh, demand response activities could um, uh, you know help mitigate those situations and then reverse cap uh, reserve capacity that standby capacity uh, available capacity and uh, demand response capability uh, dispatched during system peak periods um, and also as a load shedding mitigation. And further, or in terms of the wholesale um, energy, this is evolving, uh, displacing the need uh, to produce energy from another generating source um, and also avoid grid related losses due to proximity of DER to end uh, user loads. Um, overall as well, uh, in terms of the risk management perspective and portfolio management. What we've noted is our portfolio is increasing. Uh, if you look at our utility connected uh, generation, uh, steam rust, uh, gas turbines, which amounts to about 240 megawatts. Additional to that, we have uh, DERs coming uh, to, to the fore and all of this uh, needs to be, to be managed. Uh, coming to the DER roadmap, um, I've broken it into four, and this is guided by the energy strategy. Uh, the left side, um, at beginning about 2021 or so, we started to look at these uh, points of interest and putting structures in place. Um, so uh, enhance existing infrastructure and storage. Storage is... Uh, uh, quite critical in terms of um, uh, balancing activities. Uh, fortunately, the city uh, has got a big battery in the form of the pumped storage scheme, uh, but that is something that um, uh, you know utilities and municipalities will have to look at. Uh, but I think the easiest to implement would be battery energy storage systems rather than pumped storage system. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hosting capacity. Uh, that is with special focus in uh, the fair, equitable uh, grid access, hosting capacity, power flows, constraints, determination of uh, network support services, et cetera. Procurement, uh, big thing. Uh, we have um, markets that are detailed in the, that's uh, wholesale markets uh, detailed in the electricity regulation uh, amendment bill and also structuring in terms of um, the, the codes um, and that will soon be out for comment. But prior to that, um, with regards more specifically with the city, because we had to implement some of these things, um, we went via um, the Municipal Financial Management Act, that is the supply chain management um, to um, advertised tenders for which we've received some bids that are being evaluated. And we expect by about 2026, 20, 27, there will be a significant amount of generation assets or DERs rather, uh, that will be under the management of the distribution system operator. And, and also um, together with that as well is the demand response aggregators. Um, we've got one that is already active contract. Um, to implement uh, part uh, uh, and uh, as part of the uh, utility reform. Um, so overall, we expect to see uh, some a mix of non-dispatchable, um, unorchestrated, uh, and as well as a dispatchable DER uh, coming to the fore over the next few years or so. Uh, really uh, extremely challenging uh, 
which leads us to the uh, technology uh, because it, it, the modern grids, you, you really can't operate from a, a paper network diagram or a spreadsheet. Uh, it's become very, very complex. And most importantly as well, very, very key is to have uh, network access, uh, visibility and control systems. We saw um, Frederick, uh, he spoke quite intensively about the DERM system. Um, what happened in our case is we, um, um, we were uh, migrating uh, the advanced distribution management system from uh, uh, version six to a much more enhanced uh, version 10 and also made a, a decision uh, to have um, uh, GIS as the master data source. Uh, however, we've had to resolve some uh, integration uh, challenges uh, and this is ongoing work. Uh, we expect that the um, uh, advanced distribution management system and uh, related applications uh, will have a SCADA functionality, uh, energy management system, uh, generation management system. Uh, at the moment, we've got an uh, uh, automatic generation system, but the GMS is a much more expanded one and more for utility um, uh, connected generation. Does. And also um, uh, introducing um, aspects of uh, uh, the DERM system and uh, um, active power network management system in the interim, because the uh, resources that are coming cannot wait for the technology. So this is really a challenge, um, because what do we use in the interim? So we have some pretty creative ways that we are using as a buffer whilst the engineering is taking place in terms of uh, the um, more advanced uh, systems that we would need in future. So that's all in the pipeline, but most importantly as well is the load forecasting uh, that will then um, provide uh, uh, a guidance in terms of the what is required in future from the market uh, through the um, market operator uh, who would then go to market to procure uh, that generation. Uh, alternatively, I think there's a, there's a path as well where we can actually directly have bilateral agreements with uh, some of the DERs or IPPs. Um, the city has also introduced recently uh, a simplified online small scale embedded generation application um, uh, system uh, which is being piloted. And uh, because of the numerous uh, amount of applications that are coming in to, uh, to connect uh, these uh, resources. And this, um, we, we saw an increase around about 2022 uh, when we started to uh, experience more uh, stage six uh, higher stages, load shedding, et cetera. But we don't expect that this will decline. Uh, it seems like the genius is out of the bottle and uh, there's no way um, uh, to put it back in. Uh, what we expect as well is that the um, uh, power system will find equilibrium uh, where there will be a balance in terms of um, the um, uh, conventional power stations that will be provided by the uh, transmission system operator and also in terms of what the uh, distributed energy resources will be able to contribute from the municipal distribution and also ESCOM distribution um, uh, grid. Uh, institutional and workforce uh, reforms. We've done quite an extensive review of existing uh, business uh, models uh, to align with with the changes that are taking place. There is also um, HR uh, human resource capability that needs to be reviewed, realigned, reskilled, very important. And um, uh, different roles that have unfolded, uh, more specifically in terms of um, areas of project management, procurement, et cetera, of the necessary generation. Um, skills required on the technological side of things in terms of um, 
the um, in terms of the DMS, uh, the, uh, rather than uh, uh, basic uh, SCADA uh, functionality. Uh, the role of the distribution system operator and introduction of the market operator, uh, the city has gone uh, towards, uh, tending towards the hybrid model. Um, and th these are all critical to enabling the secure and efficient orchestration and participation of aggregated DERs in the power system. And then of course, um, uh, in parallel with all this is the tariff and financial reform that are uh, underway. And uh, we, we see uh, tariff signaling uh, being part of uh, the uh, management uh, mechanism uh, that will entail that the system operator will be able to provide provide the DERs or aggregators so that they can make more informed decisions. And then um, the last slide, uh, Chris, um, embracing the change, uh, general challenges as indicated is embracing uh, the, the, the change management uh, structures, uh, reskilling, ongoing training and development. Um, lots of gaps there, we are currently um, uh, tightening or closing those gaps. And in the absence of training, there is not sufficient training yet. So some of these things are being developed in-house. Uh, investment in OTIT uh, systems, uh, this is very, very critical because uh, these um, the, the, the modern grid is very complex. Uh, I need not say more. Uh, faster retail adoption than system can accommodate, very true. Uh, we're seeing things that are guiding uh, changes in our terrain. And then some of the technical considerations, um, uh, immediate to, to long-term uh, voltage is quite uh, critical in terms of stability and regulation, uh, playing out already on the LVMV uh, in terms of the voltage and thermal limits. Uh, frequency stability, uh, obviously with uh, those assets, you can expect faster rate of change of frequency. Uh, so we need to have some discussions around that. I think the uh, transmission system operator need to come uh, to the party here as well, because uh, there's quite some modifications that need to take place. Grid uh, flexibility um, uh, supported by flex flexible energy resources. Uh, battery energy systems, uh, some of those systems, uh, system protection that need to be relooked, uh, distribution congestion, very big. We've seen that already playing at MVL this uh, level. Uh, black start blackout capability in a high DER environment. Um, we have to consider a system, a total system uh, modeling. Um, and uh, this is where appointments need to come in in terms of uh, system optimization rather than network optimization, for instance, um, because we have to consider cascading effects uh, of uh, failures or disturbances that could occur on the distribution network that might impact upstream. Um, and then grid forming uh, capability, uh, we introducing um, a high uh, uh, conductor, uh, semiconductor inverters in the circuit. So those uh, considerations need to be taken into account and from a quality of supply, control system interact, uh, interactions and resonances. And then most importantly, with this digitization comes uh, cyber security. Uh, so we need to continuously implement OTIT uh, technology to manage the, the challenges. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much, Gordon, uh, and really a fascinating how this, this uh, evolution, uh, you know, from a central transmission system operator to a transmission operator plus distributed system or distribution system operators in the major metros uh, and, and how this is going to lead into the, the electricity market in the future. Uh, and, and yeah, really some interesting challenges that are faced, uh, but uh, some great work that's being done by Dindi and his team at the city of Cape Town. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, having heard these four presenters, that is Vali Pariachi, uh, Frederick Yavauqui, uh, uh, Gordon Dindi and Paul Vermeulen, I'm now going to share a link um, to a short poll and a survey 
on the Teams chat facility. Uh, so my producer, Ian, if you could please share the survey link uh, on the chat facility. And please, can I ask all of you, all of you present, to take just a minute now, not more than a minute, to complete uh, this survey. It's an online survey and submit the survey poll, which will give us some very valuable feedback on further follow-up actions and webinars on the subject of distributed energy resource management uh, going forward. I think you can hear that this is a fast evolving topic in South Africa, uh, but as uh, Fred pointed out, uh, there's a lot uh, to learn from other countries uh, who have done it and been there and, uh, and uh, uh, done what is necessary. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we can learn uh, from uh, others. Okay, I see the link has been shared. I'm just clicking on it myself uh and to see that it's working uh it seems to be working i hope mm, yes it is uh so certainly on my side and i hope it is with all of yours uh there are some questions there uh with some uh, multiple answers uh not shall we say single selection answers uh, and then finally uh press the submit button uh so look while we um while the presenters are doing this um, I think it's worth uh, mentioning that we've had a bit of trouble with the Q&A facility, but we've had a lot of interaction uh, on, the, uh, on the chat facility. And I'm going to be asking our uh, presenters uh, to please switch on their microphones and their cameras. Um, and uh, we're going to take some questions via hands up uh, to start off with. So I'm looking at the... Um, the list of people that are uh, that are present, and I'm going to ask you to please put up your hand if you would like to uh, ask a verbal question. Uh, so please uh, think about putting up your hand. I see you've got two hands up at the moment, um, and the first one is simply called PH. PH, I hope you're there. I'm going to switch on your microphone or allow your mic to be switched on. Uh, PH, if you can switch on your microphone and you've got the presenters standing by, please pose your question and I will put them to one or other of the presenters. Uh, are you online, PH? Thank you, Chris. And sorry about the PH, it's Penny. Um, you're really Hello, Penny. my voice. Okay, well, yes. well thanks for, for allowing me to raise some questions. I noted, you know, at the beginning of this presentation that Australia is being sort of used as a benchmark for some of these um, concepts, but at the same time also noted um, that um, the CSIRO of Australia has been severely criticised for the lack of analysis on the cost of integration into the grid. Um, and I, I, I was looking really for your presenters to touch on some of this. I think Gordon, to some extent, um, did raise costs via tariff structuring, um, and he also briefly raised risks. But I'm really concerned that we don't seem to have a handle, aside from the technical challenges, on what the costs are going to be of this and where some of the costs uh, uh, and risks associated with increased costs are going to be borne, um, especially in the light of some of the privatization discussions. I mean, I think there's the risk allocation framework and the cost issues are taking a backseat. And um, I think this needs to be addressed quite significantly and urgently. Perhaps some of the presenters can, um, can comment on that. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I would like to then put that to Frederick because uh, he probably has got a more of a global picture than many of us um, in South Africa. But uh, it, uh, uh, Fred, to what extent is the cost of doing all this an inhibiting factor, or should we be rather saying, what is the cost of not doing this? Uh, because we know, uh, you know, that these constraints are coming. Uh, some of them are here, and Valley has talked about the constipated networks. Uh, but uh, can you comment, uh, you know, to Penny's question on, on the costs? Yeah, thanks a lot. I think the, I mean, there's, there's. Uh, the, the business casing for uh, addressing those DR challenges and, and turning DRs from a threat to an opportunity has, has various uh, layers. And uh, as uh, I think Paul had, had shown or 
I was Gordon. I mean, th there are all those slices of business cases that that should really be all factored in together. Uh, and so, and indeed, the business case is way easier when you put together the, you know, every, every factor, right, from distribution to transmission, system reliability, uh, the end customer quality of service, and, and of course, in this particular case, uh, a lot of the generation capacity uh, business case, right. And so, so that's something that that we as vendors we can we can help with, uh, you know, and 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 indeed, you know, showing some some examples from other geographies. So very happy to uh, to help uh, building the business case. Yeah, Penny, I will be happy to connect you with Frederick uh, after this webinar. Please drop me a line, Penny, and I will make sure you are connected with Frederick for more comprehensive answer on that. Uh, thanks for keeping it short, uh, Fred, because we've got a lot of questions to get through. And I ask all the presenters to please keep their responses as uh, short as possible and to the to the audience to keep their questions uh, short and sharp uh, and to the point. So I'm now looking at Hendrik uh, Twala. Hendrik, um, I'm going to allow you to uh, switch on your microphone. So please do switch it on. And we're looking forward to your question. Thank you, uh, uh, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, all the presenters, and thanks for the present for the presentations. Uh, Chris, I, I I was actually hoping that I could get to the uh, regulatory uh, framework that is going to be applicable to this uh, uh, DMRs, but unfortunately, so far I, I haven't uh, put my hands on 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 anything. To that nature. So what I wanted, what I want to find out is, is there any regulatory framework, especially in South Africa, that is applicable to these DERs? And if so, will uh, uh, the licensed distributors uh, be able to recover the cost of installing or, or, or probably uh, <coughs> installing or maintaining uh, uh, those DERs? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a really interesting question, and I, I'm going to put this to. Uh, Paul, in this uh, instance, uh, Paul, what kind of role does the regulator, the national energy regulator, play in this space? Uh, is uh, are we being held up uh, through the regulatory environment, um, and um, and what needs to be done, if so, uh, to unlock the regulatory environment to make uh, this happen? So I think that from the technical point of view, there are regulatory. Uh, um, things in place, the, the renewable energy grid code, the battery energy grid code, those things do define how these things should be connected to the grid. They might not go into the, the kind of detail that you're thinking, but they definitely do exist. Um, you know, from the from the cost side again, or, or, or let, let's put it, we are a regulated industry. So we, we, we do, and it's also through NECOM, for example, sorry about that, through NECOM, we've, we, we've had a lot of effort put into getting trading and wheeling working, a lot of effort to getting small scale embedded generation tariffs, uh, feed in tariffs going. So, so there's definitely a lot happening there. Maybe it's happening a little bit slowly, but there are things happening. For example, also on demand response. Um, it's it, In some respects, it's up to us to decide now how we're going to play that game. You know, obviously, it would be for our for, for our benefit to to offer a demand response, but then also have a back to back agreement with 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 Eskom, so that what what whatever we earn in in terms of the demand response, we can pass on to our customers as well, and work within those those frameworks. In some cases, the regulatory framework is restrictive. You know, you think, and and I know Gordon and company actually struggled quite a lot to to get to a point where they could pay. For the surplus that a DER is putting into the into the grid, but they've got they've managed to get exemption for that. So these things are happening, but perhaps they're not happening as at a rate that 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 they should. For me, one of the disappointing things is that we're in a position where the private sector is running away from us. Um, and what I mean by that is that we, we we're going all out to support trading and wheeling between a private IPP and a private off taker. But we're falling behind in terms of of engaging our own IPPs, and and why I say that, why I say that that's a disadvantage is that, for example, PV energy is 
it's it's at a fixed cost and it's it's actually cheaper than Eskom at the moment. But it's very difficult for us to to seem to grab a hold of that. Um, if a municipality wants to engage in IPP or its own embedded generation, it's meant to follow a triple P process, which is a pretty laborious and onerous thing to to have to do. So in some respects we're falling behind, but I think the private sector is 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 racing ahead, and and it's not that it's total loss for us because an IPP trading and wheeling across our network still got to pass the wheeling charge, um, and and maybe the benefit there is that they come with the with their checkbook, whereas we, as Vali had mentioned, we are we are at the point where capital is so thin because you need to 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 restore your networks and re, and refurbish networks. Um, I'm I'm not too sure what that backlog maintenance backlog is at the moment, but it is huge. Thank you. So I hope that you've some Look, um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to move on. Uh, we've got a lot to get through. Um, and I see uh, Simon Hoch. I think that's how you pronounce it, Simon. Uh, please, can you um, uh, switch on your microphone and ask your question? Thank you. Yes, Chris, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, the distributed energy resource management, the area that, uh, that we're quite interested in is rather load reduction. And if I look at one of the most overlooked load reduction uh, areas in South Africa when we compare it with Europe is to reduce the hot water demand and also to reduce the time of use of hot water and or the time that hot water is heated. So, I mean, if you look at what the Finns are doing when they're storing energy in thermal batteries and uh, various using various materials, sand, salt, et cetera, et cetera, we see very little of this uh, in South Africa. And if you're looking at uh, the distributed energy management, uh, if you reduce the load, that helps all the fingers on the hand, should I say. Um, mm -hmm. And and we don't we don't see enough of that being uh, being investigated, perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Simon. I'm going to put this question to Valley. Valley, I'm not sure if you attended our last webinar, which was on energy efficiency and um, uh, and and hot water heating was a very big part of that. Uh, you know, hot water heater control uh, through uh, you know intelligent uh, systems. Um, but can you perhaps respond to that question from Simon? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Simon, for the question. Uh, I would agree that in terms of the quantum of people looking at it, it's not much. But there are there are few players in the marketplace, uh, I actually deal with almost all of them, that are doing some excellent work uh, in trying to address uh, that particular technology. Because uh, I agree, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, uh, it's a big shift in energy savings, because there's about seven, seven to eight million geysers. And if you look at about 2.3, 2.4 kilowatts, it's a significant load. So uh, there are players looking at it. There's a big migration from, uh, of course, uh, ripple control. Uh, as Paul and I would talk about, we did a lot of work in city power, and uh, but that was single direction. And now we're getting into technology, which is bi-directional, et cetera. But to answer your question directly, uh, it's not too many people on the marketplace but that number is increasing. In fact, just the other day, I met with two of them. So, but I agree, the geyser load, hot water load, is significant savings that can be made. Back to you, Chief. Thanks for that, Valley. Uh, Simon, if you're interested, please drop me a line. I'll put you in touch uh, with two presenters uh, uh, that were at our last webinar uh, from the University of Advanced um, and they are doing really interesting work uh, on the opportunities in the hot water heating, in the uh, the water heating sector, uh, and the uh, energy storage sector in the, the, the thermal uh, you know, space. So um, I'm now looking at the next uh, hands upper, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, R. C. Chizonga. Uh, please, R. C. I'm switching on your microphone now. And uh, please ask your question. Are you there, RC? You, you're, please switch on your mic. I have 
enabled it. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, RC. Uh, thank you, Chris, and all the presenters. Uh, you did well. You pronounced it 100%. <laughs> Yeah, um, Chris, I just wanted to know, probably from Frederick, uh, in the context of Europe, what is the common storage form that is, uh, you know, being used? Bearing in mind what uh, I think it was the gentleman from Cape Town City who spoke about the problems with frequency and inertia. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, Thanks can you handle that, Fred? Yeah, sure. So, so yeah, I mean, Europe is a, a combination of storage solutions. Uh, there's, I mean, started like in many other geographies with like grid scale storage. And we had pilot projects using those sorts of, of grid storage uh, megawatt size already 10 years back. And so that, that's been uh, quite widely uh, spread. Uh, in this form, it's either, you know, owned by the grid operator themselves or uh, coupled in some uh, regulatory regime, directly coupled as hybrids with the, the solar or wind power plants themselves. Uh, so that directly on the site, you can provide some, some good uh, regulation directly on site that makes the life of grid operation uh, easier. So that's one. And then there's a lot, also a lot of uh, residential type storage or commercial type storage. Uh, so very small dispersed and so quite innovative uh, actors in, in this space. Uh, some became global, right? But so, yeah, so, so there's, there's, there's a lot there. And obviously now uh, storage is bridging into uh, EV charging with some actors who are providing some, some good, uh, you know, solutions there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, for that, Fred. Yeah, a range of solutions in the storage space. And uh, I want to put this next question, uh, which is from me, actually, uh, to Gordon. Um, uh, Gordon, uh, OK, we've talked about uh, distributed uh, storage, you know, at residential and commercial level, you know, in areas like the, the Cape Town Metro. Uh, also, uh, you know, the advent of uh, smart inverters and smart batteries that can communicate and I, I wanted to ask you, uh, to what extent is your distribution system operator able to dispatch uh, distributed battery storage at residential or, or, or commercial level uh, and uh, also dispatch generation uh, from uh, solar PV and to be able to curtail uh, you know, generation from PV as and when needed? Uh, and, and, and also curtail the amount of charging from batteries, uh, you know, after, for example, an extended load shedding period. Uh, you know, I would think that within the advent of smart inverters and smart batteries and communication, data communication, that this is a resource that should come to uh, fruition. And I'm just trying to find out how far are things down the road in reality? And do you see this as uh, something of the future? And also, as Fred pointed out, uh, you know, what about dispatching uh, battery storage from electric vehicles at night or wh whatever? I'm just trying to get an idea of how far we are advanced in this field technically. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, it is an area that we've uh, looked at quite uh, intensively. Um, we've appointed recently appointed a demand response uh, contractor uh, with a mandate to uh, provide uh, 60 uh, megawatts, and they uh, they will be engaging directly with the customer. Uh, and then there is uh, infrastructure that will be put in place uh, in terms of the signaling that comes from our end to uh, the demand response contractor. Um, and they would then have their infrastructure that goes into uh, the various uh, residentials or commercials, and then we get the required megawatts mm. uh, reduction. So they, they, that, that, that's a process, and that also addresses mm. the issue of uh, batteries behind the meter, because there's two aspects to battery storage. You, you've got one that we are piloting. We're currently piloting a, a battery energy system, um, which will be utility connected. 
So we can dispatch that directly. And then from a demand response uh, perspective, we should be able to um, get those megawatts uh, via the uh, demand response uh, infrastructure. So there is some mm. controllability there. Uh, the initial mm. systems that came to the fore in terms of the um, solar PV particularly, uh, those are passive systems. Um, they mm. are passive DERs, they are having an influence on, on our grid. Uh, fortunately, um, we do have quite a significant amount of dispatchable generation. Uh, you could actually uh, call it a battery that says DNRAS that we can then utilize as required um, when the solar irradiance uh, starts to decline and all those customers come and uh, start accessing the grid. And then we see that uh, massive ramp up. Uh, so during mm -hmm. those periods from 16, 1700 or so, uh, as we rise towards the peak, we then dispatch a unit additional or two, et cetera, to, um, with a view to uh, flatten, flatten the load profile. I don't know if that's, uh, that helps. Yeah, thanks. And I'd like to just as, uh, put this also to Frederick as a last question, because we're going to have to call it a day. Now we actually are significantly over time, uh, but I thought uh, I'd like to put this to Frederick to have the last word. And, and that is uh, in other countries and globally, uh, are we seeing, uh, you know, distributed uh, resources down to the residential level and the commercial level uh, being able to be curtailed and dispatched either by aggregators or by distribution system operators themselves? How far is the rest of the world down this path? Thank you. Yeah, it, it's very mature, frankly. Uh, and, and notably what I to call out is the fact that uh, you were mentioning smart inverters. I mean, this IEEE 2030.5, communication protocol has been uh, set up to allow precisely smart inverter communications. So there's a zillion things you can do to uh, influence the, the voltage, the VARs, uh, the active power on that, on all these smart inverters, and, and you can directly dispatch to a whole fleet. And it works It works very nicely, frankly. We've got deployments in North America, in Australia, that are, that are, that are running uh, live uh, at scale. And so, and you can also schedule those, right? What I was showing with those dynamic operating envelopes, you cannot just, uh, you know, you, you can send exactly the, the, you know, the behavior that you'd like, but you much better is sending ranges that you'd like the DR to act within. Mm -hmm. And so, because then that that leaves much more freedom for the aggregator and the DR owner to, you know, use the DR the way they like best for their own little business case, but within the constraints of the grid. So yeah, there's mm -hmm. there's there's good success uh, stories there. Mm -hmm. And, and really you need, so I 2 and also you need the terms that abstract all those various DRs, right? Ultimately, everything we've discussed here with smart inverters, with big storage, smaller storage, all sorts of generation that, that Paul also was, was describing, you need a DERM solution that is not tied to one particular, right? That mm -hmm. abstract all of those into, you know, I want this type of service, you know, whichever is the, the combination of the demand response, smart inverter, curtailment, battery, EV, whatever, you know, I want all these to contribute. And so that's that's the abstraction that, that the DERMS is, is uh, you know, if, it, if it's a good one, is about to provide you. Yeah. So look, the message I take away from what you've said, Fred, is the need for standardization. Uh, really critical and 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 the, the really important role that in uh, you know information and communication technology uh, IT smart systems are going to play in this space uh, and that these smart solutions uh, you know using IT artificial intelligence uh, and and, uh, and communications is really going to enable us to uh, shall we say unconstipate the system and um, and really get uh, help us get more out of our existing uh, networks, our existing grid, which is going to save huge amounts of investment and it's going to speed things up because grid upgrades we know is extremely difficult in this environment we live in. Uh, land rights, uh, servitudes, uh, lines, power lines, cables, it, it, it's really a, a slow business. So the more we can get out of the existing networks, the existing grid, the better. And I really value, I thought your 
your analogy there of volts, ohms, and amps, you know, really, you know, made it clear to me. <laughs> uh, so thank you, uh, all of our presenters. Uh, thank you uh, for your the time that you've put in um, and the effort you've put in in making this a really interesting uh, starter of an event because I think there's more to follow. Uh, I think everybody can see that this is a wide open field. We're behind the curve. We can learn uh, where others have uh, tread before us. Uh, we don't have to learn the hard way. Uh, we need to partner. We need to standardize. Uh, we need to set a roadmap going forward. And I hope that this webinar uh, has sort of given some thought. Uh, I'm sorry we haven't been able to take many more questions, but we're really out of time. We're 15 minutes over time. Uh, it's been a great uh, session. and I've really enjoyed it. So thank you and good afternoon to you all.